in 2 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to read the whole chapter. Praise God. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick, and when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat or food, and dress me the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. I don't know about you, but that's just weird already. <laughs> <laughs> so Amnon lay down and made himself sick, and when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down. She took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber, that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly, and I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Basically, she was saying, if you ask him, he'll let us get married. Howbeit he would not hearken, it would have still been wrong, by the way. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of diverse colors upon her. What does that remind you of? For with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. It came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal-hazor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now thy servant hath sheep shearers. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with your servant. And the king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. 
and he pressed him. Howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him, and he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. The servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him up upon his mule and fled. And it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to David, saying, Absalom hath slain all the king's sons, and there is not one of them left. Then the king arose and tear his garments and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. And Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for, Am for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, has, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister to mar. Now therefore let not, not my lord the king take this thing to, to his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead. But Absalom fled, and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside behind him. And Jonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's sons come, as thy servant said, so it is. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, that behold, the king's sons came, and lifted up their voice, and wept. And the king also, and all his servants, wept very sore. But Absalom fled, and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur, which w and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just ask you, sweet Holy Spirit, that you would lead and guide, Lord God, that you would speak what you once spoken from this passage of Scripture. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. What a story. Huh? You know, the Bible just tells it like it is. The Bible doesn't shrink back, doesn't try to hide things, doesn't dilute it. It wants us to be able to see uh, everything in its real character because the Lord wants us to understand the things that go on in the kingdom of God and, 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 and really in the people of God in their lives. You know, what I, but, but I do believe this. I do believe that there's a lot, many layers to this story, many ways that this story could be preached. One of the main things, and I'm really not going to talk about this tonight, is that it reminds me Amnon is a type of, I would say, sin and the power of sin and how it seduces. And when it's all said and done, that sin leaves us locked outside and we feel unworthy. We feel unworthy to come back and feel the Father's embrace, to feel the love of the Father. It wants to leave us outside the door locked and bolted and make us feel unworthy. That is a major theme that I have gotten from this story for many years. That's not really the way I'm going to preach it exactly tonight, I feel like the Lord kind of, I woke up this morning and I said, Lord, is that really what you want me to preach? And if it is, I want to hear your voice. And so I went to the Lord in prayer and this is the way that it ended up being. I kind of like ended up writing some of these concepts down. Really, it all happened today while I was praying. And you know, what the Lord wanted me to do first off was to kind of talk about the characters a little now, I've mentioned this to you many times before, but let me say it again. The Lord showed me many times, many years ago, that whenever we're talking about the Old Testament, that Old Testament Israel is like a big brother. Christian is like a little brother. They were the people of God. We are the people of God. Amen. And so there is a common unity between both covenants, between both testaments that we can learn from their, their journeys their travels, their lives, their stories, even within their names, New Testament truth can be found within the pages of Old Testament Scripture. I believe this story contains great New Testament truth within it, and <laughs> I believe that it reveals to us many aspects that can be inside the heart of God's people. Now, 
I hope and pray that we don't have this kind of shenanigans going on in the church. Hallelujah. But I can promise you things like this have happened within the church. Amen. The church as a whole. Right. Things worse than this. I can promise you that there have been affairs that have turned into murder and even things worse. You know, than, than the story. But what I am trying to say is that while we may, you may, because see, if I preach it that way, you're going to turn me off. You'd be like, oh, no, 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 I never, never did that. It never, never, but we need to understand that within this story are many types and shadows of lust, various lusts of the flesh. And so we want to be able to see some of these things. First off, I want to start with the character of Amnon, right? So he is a child of the king, is he not? He's one of David's sons. But he's vexed to the point of sickness. The vexation has gotten a hold of him. There's one word within the story, and I was looking for it earlier to show it to you, but it was in my first studies of it yesterday when I kind of read through, that it talked about singleness of mind. The idea behind the word was that once he had become vexed with this thing, and plus, let me just let you know, the word love there, it also has the meaning of immorality. So we pretty much knew from the beginning it wasn't really love, and the end result we knew it wasn't really love, because love doesn't do what he did. So in reality, the word would have been translated better had it been more descriptive of sin. But in his mind, in his heart, he was convinced what he was feeling was love. But whenever this vexation grabbed a hold of him, whenever this thing, whatever it was, it was a spirit. There were demon spirits then. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, at this time, Goliath is already dead. So who knows? Maybe it was his spirit running around. I don't know, but we're not going to get into that right now. But let me say this. There were spirits there already affecting God's people. Yes. Demonic spirits. He's vexed by this thing. And this thing's grabbed a hold of him. And, and, and when a demon spirit gets a hold of you and binds you by sin... Or, or, or listen, for those of you that the story is still out on you and you're not sure what to believe about demonic spirits, let's just talk about the sinful nature. The sinful nature is flared up. Let's call it that. We're used to that terminology. The sinful nature is not supposed to be flared up in Christianity. The sinful na nature is supposed to be dormant in the Christian's life. True Christianity teaches us that Jesus Christ died so that our the power of sin would not be risen in our hearts and in our lives. But many times believers find themselves bound up. They find themselves unwilling to be able to do their words or like the apostle himself when he said, the thing that I want to do, I don't do. The thing that I don't want to do, that is what I do. Oh, wretched man, who will deliver me from this body of death? It happened to the Apostle Paul, and I could prove it if I had time, that it was after he was a believer. I believe it was when he was in the Arabian desert, but that's another story. He's vexed to the sickness. He's vexed to the point of sickness. His, his, that was actually his cousin, by the way. I don't know if y'all caught that. Jonah dad was his cousin. He was Shimei, also known as Shama, which was David's brother's son. So that's his first cousin. So he got a lot of weird stuff going on in his family. This isn't just friends. This is a family. One, somewhere in these notes, I put, what a dysfunctional family, right? You know, sometimes churches operate dysfunctionally. I, I'm getting way ahead of myself in my notes, but sometimes church, I'm not saying this church is functioning this, this, this church is functioning dysfunctionally. I'm trying to say many times churches do function dysfunctionally. Why? Because, see, just like you, we can get in the habit of talking about our real brothers or sisters in such a way, right? We can also do the same about brothers and sisters in the faith. We can talk behind their back. We can slander them. We may not even always have the right motives in our heart towards them. We need to be able to search our hearts and be real with ourselves. Let the Holy Spirit have his way to reveal our own hearts to ourselves. So he's vexed to this point of sickness. His cousin, Jonadab, actually said in the ESV version, it says, why are you haggard? Like, you look, you look haggard. You look downcast. The enemy's grabbed a hold of you. Why you look so sick? I love her. I love her to the point of sickness. I got to have her. See, whenever the enemy grabs a hold of you, all you can think about is that thing that he's got you with. Night and day, night and day, you're not singing about Jesus. Isn't that one of the songs that we sing? Night and day, day and night, let incense rise. Right? So, we're always, so the song would be something like that. The song would be, we're over here worshiping the Lord. We're letting our incense go before the Lord. But when the, when the devil got you vexed, 
then that's not what you're thinking about. You're not thinking about letting incense rise to the Lord. You're thinking about that one thing that your mind caught up on. Amnon got his mind on tomorrow. And he's not supposed to have his mind on. And Jonadab, his cousin, is supposed to be helping his brother. Oh, but he's going to come help, all right. But well, look what he says right here. So there's a spot in the meaning of these words. I said that, all right. Singular and focused. This love word can also mean immorality. And it shows you in language like a diagnostician. Listen, when you're overwhelmed, I, I put this word, it's a big word, diagnostician. What is that? A person that takes signs and symptoms and he makes a diagnosis. It's not that hard of a word. A diagnosis. The Lord showed me when he first started moving on me a little bit different here recently. He said, you've been in healthcare, so why don't you just take the signs and symptoms and make a diagnosis? Yes. You can see it. You can read it on people's face, my friend. You can look at people's countenance, and you can see whether or not they're bound by a spirit of heaviness. If you want to look close enough, the Lord will show you if they're bound by pride. And if you listen long enough, and you release, and they release the words, signs and symptoms. They release words out of their mouth. It doesn't take hard. It's not very. It doesn't take a whole lot of discernment to start to weave the picture together. There's words that are coming out of the situation. And, and one that practices discernment can begin to receive the clues of countenance, conversation, to determine the condition of the heart. When sin grips your heart, you become compelled by the thing. Whether it's a person, a drug, a job, a child, a house, a car, a business, it doesn't matter what it is. Once it has you, it becomes bigger than God in your life. He wasn't supposed to have them. Period. Done deal from the get. That's why the first time I read the story when I said you loved her, no, you weren't supposed to have her. The word of the Lord says in Leviticus 18 and 9, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You're not supposed to uncover her nakedness. See, this is where God's people go wrong. They are the only ones with the hope of his word, yet armed with his word, they still don't fear him and treat his instruction as the, they treat, we, you know what we do sometimes? And listen, I'm talking to the preacher, so you know, let's just take our guard down. It's okay. Let's just go ahead. Let's take our guard down. But let me speak truth. Don't try to stop me from speaking truth. Amen? Amen. It's not going to work. Hallelujah. I don't care if you even twist your face up at me. I, it's not going to work. This is what we do with this instruction. We treat it like a recommendation instead of the word of God. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just a recommendation. No, no, no. It's not a recommendation. It's the written word of God. It's the holy word of God. The world might look at the word of God that way. But you and I, as blood-bought believers and understanding the price that was paid, should be looking at the word of God as though it is his authority in our life. Amen. So let's look at tomorrow a little bit. She's a child of the king. I look at it. She's pure to me. Her heart is right. I see her character as a young. This is just what I get out of it. I don't, they, they didn't give me a lot of information, but this is what I see. She's young, sweet, innocent girl. She wants to please her father. She wants to serve her brother in his need. Typologically, she'd be an awesome sister in Christ, right? She could be one of our own daughters. She has so much promise. Raised in the house of the king, access to all of its privileges. She proudly wears the virgin's coat. Kind of reminds me of the garment that Joseph wrote, right? Yeah. Coat, wore a coat of many colors. Yeah. Uh, shows uh, prominence. It kind of singles her out. All the virgins would wear the coat. Joseph also, it showed Jacob's pleasure with him. See, whenever people start to get elevated in the kingdom of God or at work or they get promoted or something, you got to be careful, Christian, because what will happen is the enemy will start bringing envy into your heart. If you're not careful, it'll start to bring jealousy. Listen to me. We're going to preach at another level. I can promise you when Jesus preached that things started to hit people in their heart at a level where you might be able to hide it in your own mind and in your own heart deep down inside, but the Holy Spirit 
sees it when it's in there. Yeah. That's one of the things that the message of truth is supposed to do is to begin to reveal like a mirror what is on the inside of us so that we'll yield ourselves to him and we'll ask him to remove it from us so that he can cleanse us so that there'll be more of him, less of us. Hallelujah. And then he'll release more of himself. Yeah. I believe that. That's right. The anointing will become stronger. We'll begin to move and operate in a stronger anointing. His presence will be more powerful in this place. I believe that. So much promise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, you know who hates these coats of many, many colors? Satan. He hates these coats. Satan hates this coat because it represents godliness. It represents her virginity. She was waiting on the right. She was trying to do the right thing, man. He wants this coat torn and stained just as he wanted Joseph's coat torn and bloody because he has a plan of destruction. And sadly for her and Joseph, Satan uses their own brothers to do the harm. You know, the, the Lord first put this on my heart. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, men out there that might watch this video. We talk about the spirit of Jezebel. What about the spirit of Amnon? Men up in the church with a spirit of lust. I'm talking about church folk right now because if you out there looking for a man in the world, boo, my friend, I was about to call you boo, my friend, you're looking in the wrong place at the wrong time. Half the time in the church, you're looking at the wrong place at the wrong time. We need some men of God that will surrender to the will of the Lord. We need some men of God that will let the Holy Spirit grab a hold of their hearts. Let the preacher talk first. Let, the, let him let the Lord deal with him. That we would learn how to treat our wives properly. That we would learn how to live surrender to the Lord properly. That we would learn how to submit ourselves to the word of God properly. And then hallelujah, God will start to do something in our families, in our lives, in our ministry. He'll bring reconciliation and healing. But help us, Lord. Yes. A deceptive trap is being set for tomorrow, right? She doesn't know it, but she's walking into a trap of Satan. And once the trap is sprung, she will not be the same. She's not going to be the same. I, I, I didn't really have time to go back and see if there's any other place in the Old Testament that tells me her final story. You may remember off the top of your head. One of you word nerds, go ahead and shout it out if you remember. Dinah. But, huh? Dinah. Dinah? Uh, Jacob. Jacob, yeah. But, uh, but do you remember the story of Tamar by any chance in the very end? That's what I was talking about. Yeah, the same thing happened to Dinah, basically. But look, she's not going to be the same, is my point. Depending on her response to the scenario, she can be made whole. That's a possibility. I'm talking about for human beings. <clears throat> when tragedy strikes their life, they can either be restored, made whole, and then be used by God in his service, <laughs> or they can perpetually live under the cloud of condemnation and guilt of the horrible sin that has ravaged their life. Yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat myself. I think I wrote it somewhere else in my notes, but will she lie in her room in the palace from here on out? Will she ask the servants for a daily ration of wine? Will she ever be married or instead will other brothers or cousins prey upon her brokenness? Will she repeatedly find herself because of the guilt and shame and torment and the wine a target for Satan to have his way in her life? This is not God's plan. You know, if I could, I'd say, rise up tomorrow. This is not God's plan for your life. Rise up and allow God to heal you, sister. Allow God to mend that garment, cleanse those ashes off your head. You don't have to live in a perpetual state of mourning. You don't have to live under this, this misery and under this cloud of condemnation and guilt. That is not God's will for your life. Jonadab, the Bible says he was subtle. Another translation says crafty. It seems like I've heard those words before. Those adjectives used for another Bible personality. Oh, yeah, I remember. He's the serpent. Crafty, subtle. <laughs> Bible describes the serpent. Jonadab orchestrates the sinful trap behind the scene, and he helps Amnon from a spiritual perspective. He uses Amnon as a pawn. To release torment into the believer's life. What kind of dysfunctional family is this? Uh, you know, but, but again, this type of drama within a church, I know it's not this bad, but you get the point. It's a mess. 
But don't you imagine, though, through gossip and slander, the lust of the flesh, that wrong can be, can, bought, can be done towards other believers? By one believer to another believer. We have to be, listen, the reason that I keep beating this drum is for this reason. And this is what, I, if you feel like when you're in prayer, I believe that many of you are praying. I believe that many of you are praying more now than maybe you've prayed in other times of your life. I could be wrong, but I believe that. Um, and so as you're praying, maybe the Lord is revealing something specific to you about what you think he wants to do in the church. I know that as I pray, I just, the simplified version is, I want this church to exalt the name of Jesus. I want the people in this church to worship me. I want the people in this congregation to live their lives for me and to exalt my name. And he keeps, I feel in my spirit that he's saying that if we will do that, he will continue to pour out his spirit. He will continue to work in our hearts and lives. He will continue to cleanse us. He will continue to empower us. And he will pour out his spirit and he will bring a harvest. I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart. And I'm going to continue to believe that because that's what he's speaking to me. Now, in the midst of all that, he's also showing me that we are a multi-membered body. And that he's releasing gifts within the body parts that form a whole body. And Jesus is the head and we are the body. Long time ago, probably a year ago, the Lord spoke to me when he told me to move out of the way. He said, I want to do what works in my body because I want to work through my body. I want to use them, son. That's what he showed me. He wants to use you. He wants to use you for his kingdom. He wants to use you in the church service, and he wants to use you outside of the walls of the church. And in order for that to happen, we have to be in unity. Yeah. We have to be a one mind and one accord. And if we will be in unity, one mind, one accord, then what will happen is we will be setting ourselves up for an opportunity for a Pentecost. Yeah. For an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. That's what I believe. Yeah. For healings, for miracles, hallelujah, for prophetic utterances, for people's lives to be changed, for deliverances to take place, for the Holy to be so palpable, so thick in this place, that's what I'm crying out for, that demon spirits will be uncomfortable, that they'll start showing themselves, yeah. that, and that people will be delivered of bondage, that it'll send those that are not even saved, that, and, and that we'll get a harvest of souls, Amen. because I don't know about you, but I believe the days are growing dark, yeah, that's right. yeah. I know they are, if you don't believe that, you're asleep. <laughs> I've talked to people out on the street at the clinic, man, and they like, you're right, dude. You are so right. Sometimes I get a better response from people in the clinic than I do people in the church. Lord, help us. That's not true. Y'all are great. But by the way, prayer was awesome last night. Hallelujah. It was so good, man. I don't mean to venture off, but prayer was so good last night, and I was sharing with a couple of people. Like, I was in the zone for a while, but then I kind of got distracted. I was looking for my keys. And, you know, sometimes I get kind of loud, but I wasn't real loud. I was a little bit distracted. And then all of a sudden, I went back here, and I turned around, and I looked. And at some point in time, everybody was just worshiping the Lord and praying. But it was, and it was out loud, because it's not always like that in our intercessory prayers, right? Intercessory. A lot of times, people are just, are just laid out at the altar, and they're quiet. And it wasn't like a big raucous, loud kind of thing. Everybody was just vocally exalting Jesus and crying out to the king. And I was like, hallelujah. Man, it ministered to my heart so much. And I, and I was just so full of the joy of the Lord. Because I was like, look up. And I said, Lord, thank you for these people. Thank you for these people that you have sent to this church. And what you're doing in their hearts and in their lives. Thank you, Lord. So I didn't want to leave y'all feeling bad like I was saying something bad about it. And then I walked out there and Kurt said, did you see what was going on? You think God wouldn't? And I was like, oh my gosh. That's exactly. If I was happy, what do you imagine he? That's what I'm trying to say. Don't try to tell me that the Lord's not pleased when his people
people call by his name, humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, he promises he will restore their land. Don't tell me that the Lord isn't pleased when his people call by his name, worship him, and exalt him, and humble themselves in his presence. No, he is worthy. Jesus said if they don't do it, then the rocks are going to cry out. Hallelujah. Let's look at Absalom. He's, he's rightly angry. I mean, wouldn't you say he's rightly angry? I think he is. He loves his sister, but boy, did he handle this wrong. He did not embrace forgiveness. He did not call out for help from God. He methodically planned out his own retribution. Deuteronomy 32, 35 says this. Vengeance is mine in retribution. In due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon him. You don't have to plan. You don't have to try to work in unison with the Holy Ghost and try to set somebody up, my friend. You don't have to take matters into your own hand. No, you just keep seeking God. And if somebody has wronged you, you pray for them that despitefully use you. You lower yourself and you cry out for their soul. What in the world would you want somebody to perish? I don't even want Obama, what was his name? Not Obama, Osama bin Laden. I don't even want him in hell. No. I didn't mean to say Obama. I don't even want Osama bin Laden in hell, man. I don't even want Saddam Hussein in hell. No. I mean, do I like what they did? Of course not. I'm trying to say, man, I don't want no soul tormented in hell. You think I want my brother or my sister just because they might have wronged me? Something's wrong with that. But Absalom didn't live according to God's word. In this instance, he said in his heart, vengeance is Absalom's. Retribution belongs to me. Anger, deception, and unforgiveness led to murder. And, you know, I was thinking about this when I was writing this message. Follow me on this. Anger, deception, and unforgiveness led to murder. I wonder how long it takes for unforgiveness to perform murder in the heart of a New Testament Christian. This is my thought on this process. Someone does me wrong, I'm supposed to forgive them, right? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's the word of the Lord. That's Jesus said that, Matthew 5, 44. Peter says, how many times, Lord? Seven? Dude, this is good. Jesus says in Matthew 8, 22, 18, 22, Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee seven times, but until, until 70 times seven. I'm not trying to be weird here, but I thought this was good. Aaron told me that, that he, was, he was talking to Jessica about this. Now, this is next level stuff. I'm just being real with you. In my opinion, it is. He said, he, he said what you think that the Lord meant by that? I don't know. I wasn't there, but this is what Aaron told me. And he said, he said 70 times 7. She said 490. That's until the end. Now, if you don't know Daniel's prophecy, you don't know what she's talking about. But if you know Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, you know 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Right. 70 times 7, 490 years. Once the 490 years are over, the end has come. Hallelujah. You don't just get that dropped in your spirit without reading the word of God. See, and I'm not trying to build nobody up, but I'm trying to say honor gets to go where honor is due. If somebody's going to study the scriptures enough to be able to connect that point. 490 years comes. To, you know what the Lord's trying to tell us? No, not just 490 times because, you see, I could probably get Bill on this. Don't really do it, Bill. But I'm just trying to say, Bill can have a notebook. He'd say, okay, the Lord said it 70 times 7, 490. If he was anything like my dad, my dad used to lick his pencil. Okay, there you go, boy. Scratch it out. 489 more to go. And he'd be counting it down. Not from God is not. He'd be doing his math. He'd be saying, he'd be counting down. But that, that ain't even to me. No, you got to forgive until the end. Because if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. You think he meant that? Oh, no, brother, I'm justified by the blood of the way. Hallelujah. I'm cleansed. I'm Grace got flowing in me. I got my faith in Calvary. Hold on a sec. The word of the Lord says, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. What does that mean if you have unforgiveness in your heart? Is it possible that we can be so deceived about our own condition that we have unforgiveness in our heart and we still think that we're okay? I'm supposed to forgive. 
And I say I forgave. But when I see them, there is aught in my heart. Deep inside, I'm full of the bitterness of Cain. Work with me. The thought of them being hurt flips through my mind. And instead of praying protection over them, my soul smiles just a little bit. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about because every last one of you has experience. Every last one of you in this room, don't sit here and look all holy in me, my friend. Every last one of us in this room has experienced what I'm talking about. Where you have been offended, where you have been hurt by another brother or a sister in the Lord. And when you see them and something happens in their life, you kind of smile a little bit on the inside of your belly. Oh, yeah, I knew they wasn't what they was talking about. That, my friend, is not good. And the Holy Ghost does not like it even a little bit. So let us get it clear. It's time for us to allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse our heart. Out and for us to quit acting like we all that and whatever they say now. <laughs> Help us, Lord. No one sees it. No one can hear it. No one but the Lord. I wonder how long it takes for that spirit of Cain to enter in. Have you ever even felt it towards your spouse before? Woo! Woo, that's not good. That's discord in the home. How are you going to have prayers answered in that house? I'm trying to help you, my friend. King David, here we go. King David, like a pastor, he was supposed to have a little more discernment than he had. He is the one called by God to manage the kingdom. God had trained him for his job in the fields with the sheep. Why didn't he see the symptom? When Amnon asked specifically for Tamar to feed him by putting the food in his mouth with her hand, why didn't the king be like, huh? Right. Well, I mean, was he too busy? Was he distracted? Lord, help. Help your servants. We're just so busy, especially as pastors. We're just so busy. I did get a call today because, yeah, I bought a timeshare a long time ago, let me tell you. And you probably think I was rude. You know how many times I've been ripped off by people? Like, Danielle would have tested this at least three times, like over $2,000 for sure. Because I bought a timeshare a long time ago. I don't recommend you do it. And the Holy Spirit told me not to, and I did it anyway. <laughs> double negative, double jeopardy, don't do it. <laughs> I didn't, well, when he told me not to, what I mean is, is that I started to have something happening in my heart, and I don't know that I really knew then that that's what it was. But now I know. If your heart starts fluttering and beating fast in a time where you never have atrial flutter before, uh, listen to that. That's a sign. Anyway, I bought the thing. It's paid off now, whatever, whatever. We've used it. But I got irritated because it wasn't what they said it was going to be. Right? I got irritated and it wasn't what I said it was going to be. And so what ended up happening is, is that I, I, I reached out. Oh, we can get you out of your timeshare. If you pay us this, then da 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 Then one, one person, it was a completely fabricated thing. Thousand bucks, boom, gone that fast. And, 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 and another time something else happened. Oh, we're going to rent your thing. Boom, 500 bucks, gone that fast. Never did do anything. So this dude called while I was working on this message. I was laying right here with my head as a pillow right here, typing on my little thing. Get a phone. I noticed the phone, missed the phone call, called him up. He's like, hey, da 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 da. I'm like, oh, who are you with, sir? Oh, we're with such and such time share. We noticed that you had some RCI points that you didn't use last year. Did you know that we can give you $1,400 for a rental? I said, sir, let me just ask you one quick question. Do I have to pay you money because I got five jobs and I'm a pastor and I'm working on a message right now? Well, there will be. I said, sir, we have nothing more to talk about because I ain't giving you no money. Well, okay. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> and what was my point? I don't know what my point was. <laughs> How much time? He's too busy. The pastor's too busy. He's too distracted. King David's too busy. He got too much stuff going on. Help us, Lord. That's why we got to get rid of some of these jobs. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, well, Pastor Matt got to get rid of some of these jobs. Some of y'all need to get a job. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is that, no, that's just pastoral counseling right there. Don't get mad at him. He that doesn't work doesn't eat. That's what the Word of God says. Amen. I say that with all love, yeah. all kindness. Hallelujah. And I mean that. I want God's blessings on your life. Amen. Amen. 
why did he not have any discernment in that moment? Why did he not discern when Absalom asked that everyone would come to the sheep shearing? And then when David said it wasn't feasible financially, Absalom pleased that only Amnon would come. Why didn't David discern a problem at that point? He even asked him, why do you want Amnon to go so bad? And then he just kept pleading and he kept pleading and he kept pleading. David was like, finally, okay, just let him go. Should have been some more discernment there. That's what I think. I mean, who am I to correct King David? But I'm just saying, it seems like there should have been, right? Was it because, again, he was too busy? I went through all that. Was he so distracted that he wasn't able to see that the music ministry needed prayer? That certain people in the church were struggling with certain things? Was he so unaware that he was unable to imagine that people that love God could have hidden things in their hearts and be so deceived themselves that they could not even see the damage that they were doing to the church, to their brothers, to their sisters in the kingdom of God? Was he that distracted that he couldn't see them? So I want to, I want to go with you now to Galatians, if you could go with me. Haley to Galatians chapter 5. The Lord kind of brought me to Galatians chapter 5 and we're going to <laughs> read some of these passages of scripture. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the churches. The, the history or the commentaries will teach you that Galatia was not one church. It was a region and there were multiple churches. So the Apostle Paul had planted multiple churches. How did he do what he was doing? Wow. Holy Spirit, right? He was just planting churches everywhere he could go. All right, here we go. Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. People preaching false doctrine in the church. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So that first word I want to talk to you about is justify. I want to, I want to magnify the word justify. Let justified be magnified. Hail, hallelujah. There is, you know, and I want you to know this. I'm talking good about justification right now, but I do want you to know that there's more to the cross than just justification. Some people are like, I don't even know what justification is, preacher. Just hang tight with me. Let me give you a definition for justification. Justification is a declaration that God says you are innocent. Right. And God the Father makes that declaration not based upon your innocence, but based upon the innocence of the Lamb of God who died in your yeah. place. And when you put your faith in Jesus, whether you knew it or not, the Bible says you are no longer, you're no longer bound in sin. The Bible says you're no longer a sinner. The Bible says you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible says that you now are a child of the living God. The Bible says that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And the Father says, based upon that, that you believed in the son that he sent to die for you, that he declares you innocent. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. There might be somebody else that ain't going to let you live it down. I've had people tell me that before. Your whole church is full of drug addicts. You were a drug addict. <laughs> okay. He ain't never going to let you live it down, my friend. But guess what? That's not what the word of the Lord said. Yeah. Word of the Lord says he don't do rehab. Hey. Oh, no. He oh, does God. recreation. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. He does regeneration. Yeah. He does Holy Ghost yeah. renovation. Yeah. He gets up in there and he does work. He does a circumcision of the heart. He wields the surgeon's scalpel yeah. and he changes the inside of the individual. He changes the nature. Yeah. See, that's another part of the cross right there. Right. Regeneration. Yeah. The old man dies in Christ. Hallelujah. But look, justification is exactly what Tamar needs. She needed a revelation of justification. See, most women that are victimized are lied to by Satan and they're told that in some way they're the guilty. And honestly, listen, i got to be careful. Don't be cutting my stuff and splicing it and throwing it on the internet and making me look like something I'm not. And I'm not talking to the world out there. I'm not talking to some women's activist group. I'm talking to Christians right now. And I'm trying to make a point. And if we're honest with one another, what I'm about to say is true. A woman should never be treated this way. 
And I agree with that. No means no. I completely agree with that. No means exactly what it says. It says no. Right? Yes. But now beyond all that, let us say this because it's true. That many times sinful choices put a person in the position of compromise. That's, right. That's the word of the Lord. Right. People make sinful choices that puts them in a spot. Now they might not have even known it was sin. That's a possibility. At the time when it happened, they might not have known it was sin. But sinful choices put people in positions that open them up to compromising situations. Let's be clear about what the preacher's saying. And I've already said that. I'm talking to Christians, right? Sinful choices that lead to compromising situations that result in tragedy. Tamar needed the freedom from the guilt side of the cross. She needed justification. Hallelujah, to be placed upon her. See, sin had ravaged her life. She needed the burden lifted. Many times people are walking around under the burden of guilt. But the word of the Lord teaches through justification by faith that you're no longer guilty. That the Lord doesn't see you that way. The Father sees you as clean. He sees you as pure. I'm telling you, somebody else may never let you live down your sin. But I'm here to tell you what the Father says. And the Father, what he says is true. And he said, you put your faith in my son. And that's enough for me. Now you walk with me. You be led by me in my spirit. And if you're in this church, you ought not be talking about nobody and thinking that they're not cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Let me ask you a question. Who are you willing to forgive and who are you not willing to forgive? No, really. I mean, have you determined in your mind, I'm just saying, have you determined in your mind who's worthy of forgiveness and who's not? Let me, let me tell you why. Because see, look, in the Corinthian church, we get in the first letter to the Corinthians that there's a man that has sexual relations with his father's wife. I believe in the second letter that we're t- talking about him, but if we're not talking about him, we're talking about somebody that made a major boo-boo anyway. And the apostle Paul told him to turn one over to Satan that in the end, his soul would be saved. Right? Yes. And in the second letter, what the Lord said was this. I'm saying in the second letter... He says, restore such a one that he not be overbeared with sorrow to the point of excessive sorrow. So she needed freedom for guilt. She needed forgiveness. Sin had ravaged her life. She needed the burden lifted. That's what the truth of justification teaches. God, no longer hold your failures over your head. Somebody else may. I got names down here. Matt. Somebody else might hold your failures over your head. Brendan, Jeremy, Shane, he's not here, but they might. Wade, Michelle, but God does not. It's just as if you never sinned. Freedom. Burden lifted. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. Oh, hallelujah. Let's just take the story at face value. And when we do, we can certainly see where she is the victim. As a literal person, she was done so wrong as a type of the believer. She represents those that have been imprisoned by sin. And once sin is done with them, they're left full of guilt, shame, and hopelessness. These people need so badly to understand the justifying truth of the word of God. The truth says, no, you're not guilty because Jesus bore your guilt. In God's eyes, you're free from sin. You're forgiven. The stain is removed. And you can stop with the ashes. You no longer have to carry the burden of guilt, the feeling of worthlessness. You can, in Christ, rise up, trust God, believe Him for healing and restoration and hope for your new life. Hallelujah. Galatians 5.11 says this. And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. But there's a lot to that verse, even where it says in verse 12, I would that they were even cut off. The ESV uses the word emasculate. Some people argue over this. But you know what the Apostle Paul called, he didn't, in the King James Version, he called the Judaizers the concision. And dude, it gets kind of deep. But I'm going to just tell you what it is. See, concision, it means mutilator in the Greek. And what the ESV translate this is as emasculate. 
So what the Apostle Paul is saying, well, if they think that you circumcising yourself is going to make yourself more righteous, why don't they just go ahead and cut the whole thing off? <laughs> See, some people question whether or not that's really what's being said, but I'm telling you that's what's being said. Right. Now, you, you can do what you want with it. Well, golly, that doesn't seem like the Apostle Paul was in the spirit right there. You think that the Holy Spirit never gets irritated with the way things are going? No, really, I'm trying to ask a question. You think that God doesn't have emotion? You think that God doesn't want to pour out wrath upon mankind? You don't think that he's not long-suffering in his work with us? You think when he told Moses he didn't mean business, or how about I destroy the whole bunch and then I'll create? Yeah, I know he was testing Moses, but you think he didn't kind of mean it? He said, how about if I destroy the whole bunch and I make a people out of you, Moses? Because the Lord is giving us his word. The Lord is speaking to his people and he's asking his people to follow his ways. And, and, and anytime somebody changes the word of God and tells somebody to put their faith in another place, they're basically emasculating the power of God and they're not allowing themselves to walk in the freedom and the liberty of what the Lord has done. There's more to the cross than just justification. You will not be able to experience the feeling of freedom from guilt and shame and heartache and pain from the past if you do not let the cross have its first work. What are you talking about? What is its first work? It's the work of death to self. The cross is an instrument of death. Self must die. Flesh must be crucified. Self must die. I must decrease so that he can increase. The old man must die in order for the new man to resurrect to newness of life. But I didn't do anything. My brother raped me. I was wronged. I was mistreated. I want to wear my tattered and my stained robe. If you want to stay in misery and bondage, then you can hold on to every hurt that has ever been committed against you. Every lie spoken, every dollar stolen or not repaid, every slander, gossip, every hurtful word. But if you do, you will not be faithful to your Lord. Instead, you will be selfishly clinging to your sad little world because that is what you have become. You like the attention. You like the people feeling sorry for you. And until you can allow the death side of the cross to have its way, you will not be able to allow the justification side where the removal of the burden of the guilt and the shame and the sorrow and the heartache becomes reality. Many times people live in their sorrow. They live in their misery. Woe is me. No. Rise up. Get up. Be a man and a woman of God. Believe the truth. Hallelujah. Put your faith in the Christ. He died for you to set you free. We don't really know what she did to solace her pain. They didn't have psych drugs or benzos like we do now. I wonder what she looked like in five years, 10 years. 15 years if she remained in this state of sorrow. I wonder if she had the servant. Oh, I talked about that. Bring her more wine than usual. If she became vulnerable. Okay, doing the same to her time and again. I mean, this is how she sees herself. Worthless, dejected, full of grief. I would imagine that's how many people see themselves. Isaiah 53, 5 says this, though the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. You can release the burden of the power of the offense that clings to you. You can be free from the sorcery through sin that Satan holds sway over you. Jesus said, for Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Tamar or whatever your name might be, you don't have to keep it. Living this way, you can rise up and you can be healed if you will let him heal you. He'll heal you physically. He'll heal you spiritually. He'll heal you emotionally. He will restore you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was wondering, I wrote this down. <laughs> you may not agree with it. I'm just asking a question, really. Can, is it possible for people that believe that believe in the message of the cross. Some of you might, I'm sure everybody in here maybe understands what I'm talking about, maybe not. But, well, let me explain to you what I say. When I say the message of the cross, mostly talking about, because this is how we've taught for many, many years, sanctification. How the cross, see, people are like, dude, I've been knowing the message of the cross. I ain't talking about for justification. Everybody knows that you got to put faith in the cross to be forgiven of your sins so you get to heaven. Many times what we've taught is that the same way you received from Colossians 2.6, so shall you continue to walk in him. 
How did you receive him? Through faith in Christ and what he did for you on the cross. How do you continue to walk in him? Through faith in Christ and what he did for you on the cross. Because as you keep faith in Christ, a release of grace is poured out into your life. You need grace, power from the Holy Spirit to live in victory upon this earth. So you just look into Jesus as your righteousness. Not you trying, please read your word, please come to church, please pray. Don't stop. If you stop, you're going to mess yourself up. Okay, but listen to me. Your faith is in Christ. And what he did. You don't transfer your faith to what you do. You keep your faith in what he did. Right. Amen? But I was wondering, is it possible that we can do something weird with our faith in the cross like this? Do you think it's possible that somehow upon finding a great revelation in the word of God, that we who have believed in truth have learned a truth that many in the church maybe have not yet found, okay? And then suddenly from this mindset, started to put our faith in our own faith in the message of the cross. So it would look something like this. Man, I know the message of the cross. Them poor people down the road on the other side of the railroad track, they don't even know the message of the cross. Is it possible, and I ain't the first one to come up with this. I have heard Bible students say this before. Is it possible that we can put our faith in our own faith of the message of the cross? And in so doing, have we possibly done the very thing that many of the word of faith teachers did when they went from faith in the word to faith in their confession of the word or faith in their own faith? Before you answer too quickly, let us ask ourselves, why then? Why do we still struggle with the same things over and over again when it's very plain in the word that we are free in Christ, that the old has died and that the new man has been resurrected? It's just a thought. It's just a question. Is it possible that in our pride of knowing something that other people don't know, that we have literally put our faith in our faith in the message? Oh, in other words, look at what I know. Look at what I've put my faith in. Okay, I hope that you're shaking your head, though, because that's not you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But is it possible for somebody? Sure, yeah. Just like it's possible for somebody to put their faith in how much Bible they read. Just like it's possible for somebody to put their faith in their positive confession instead of in Christ. Just as it's possible. You understand what I'm trying to get at? So just be careful with that. Hallelujah. All right, real quick. I know it's late. I'm, I'm, we're going to stay in worship. I don't expect the work music team to stay for long. Y'all can lead us out in one song. Amen. Hallelujah. Galatians 5.20 says this. We're going to close with this. What would a couple of Galatians 5.20. See, I wanted to use the ESV because where in one of these words where it says hit hatred, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions. The ESV uses the words, let me just go ahead and find it real quick. ESV uses the words idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Drunkenness. So in this word enmity, it means the state of feeling actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. So do you think it's possible that someone could have something that could have done something to hurt you? I don't know. Maybe they took advantage of you in some way. They worked for you. They were a family member, a friend. You trusted them. You gave something to them. They did you wrong. But instead of you really praying for them and guarding your heart without realizing, you allowed enmity into your heart. Is that a possibility? That happens all day long. It happens all day long, every day in the world of the church. Do you think that's possible for believers? And then enmity turns to strife, which turns into bitterness, turns into jealousy. That even when it appears that the person is trying to repent, instead of you being happy and joyful for the brother or sister in the Holy Spirit, you get full of dissension, disagreement that leads to discord, fits of anger. And in your heart, instead of letting it go and giving it to God, you let it fester and you let it fester into bitterness. 
And the whole time it's drawing you away instead of closer to God. And the spirit's deception, the other spirit, not the Holy Spirit, the other spirit's deceiving you, telling you that you're okay. But you're not okay because the word of the Lord says, forgive others of their trespasses so that the heavenly father will forgive you of your trespass. But I have forgiven them. And I go back, I've already said it before. No, you haven't. Not if in your heart you see them making a move towards the Lord and from a self-righteous attitude, you can't wait until the next time they fall so you can talk about them. So that you can talk about them or be right in your own mind instead of wanting to see them restored. Listen to me, I know that this is hard. I've been preaching hard lately, huh? Hallelujah. I've been preaching the word of the Lord. Right. Praise God. And the reason I preach this stuff, you think that I'm just over here picking on you? If you feel something weird going on in your heart, it's because something weird's in your heart. Because let me tell you, the Lord's already dealt with me about this stuff many a time. This stuff tries to roost in the hearts of Christians. This stuff been done roosted in my heart before, after the message of the cross. And the Lord wants to deal with it. Why? Because he doesn't want us bound up. He wants us free in our spirit. He wants us to be able to release this. Listen, bitterness, a root of bitterness will derail your Christianity. Yeah. And you will think you're okay when you're not. Right. Look at this word, Ralph, rivalry. Competition for the same objective or for superiority in the same field. Lust of the flesh, rivalry. What a travesty. If Angie or Ross or Naya preaches an awesome message or Wade gives a great testimony that gets more hits on YouTube than I do. What a travesty that would be if in my insecurity I secretly have envy and rivalry in my heart. Ooh, that'd be ugly. That is. Or I have a business and someone sets up their shop right across the street. And instead of me doing inventory and determining in my heart whether there's something that God wants to show me or change in me and to trust him, I want them to fail. Secretly in my heart, I want them to fail. I want them to fall on their face. And then I will take it a step further and help the Lord make them fail. I'll try to find something on them. I'll try to find something on them, mess them up, set them up, try to make them fall. Instead of praying to the Lord, that he would do a work in me. That he would change me. This stuff can go in so many different directions. In your life. In your work environment. The people that you work with. The things that you go through. A, a spirit of rivalry. Where instead of being happy for your co-worker. If you're doing what you're supposed to do. The Lord will promote you. Hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. So I'm going to ask the music team to come up. Y'all can lead us in one song. I really don't want to ask y'all to stay late tonight, but whoever wants to stay late and worship with us, we can use the um, the um, boom box. Okay. The story of Amnon and Tamar has so many layers. I could easily do four different messages on just this one story, but one thing that stuck out to me the most is the dysfunctionality of this family. And I know that the Lord wants his family, the church, to be made whole. He wants us as his people, hallelujah, to be, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to let the Holy Spirit take inventory of our heart and our lives, to let the Holy Spirit cleanse us, Whatever may be in our heart, why don't you just take a moment, even if you can't do it here in the church tonight, take a moment tonight. Take a moment and ask the Lord to search our hearts. Mm -hmm.